Good evening and welcome to the India story with me Vikram Chandra. On this program we discuss the developments in the world's largest democracy for a global audience. Today I am going to be talking to you at some length about what we are seeing around us. The impact of climate change. And yes, yes, I know you're going to be telling me we are tired of hearing you talking about it for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. All of you have been going on talking about death and destruction and damage and the catastrophe that is approaching because of climate change. And I'm afraid it is time for us to go on talking about it because we are seeing the impact. We are seeing what is happening all around us in country after country in the world. Record temperatures, heat waves, floods, excess rainfall. And India is no stranger to that. We have been seeing a lot of unseasonal events in the sense rain happens, but rain bombs of the sort of which we have seen in Gujarat, the sort we are seeing in other states. That's unusual, that much raining, rain falling in such a short period of time and the flooding that that's causing, it is something for us to think about. But on this program, we're not just going to be talking about doomsday and how terrible things are actually on this program, we are also going to be talking about some of the solutions. Because let's face it, here in India, we've also been talking a long, long time about the other problem, water scarcity and groundwater depletion and what can we possibly do about it. So let's try on this show to put some of the dots together. If you do have excess rainfall and you have flooding and you have excess water in some parts of the country and at some times of the year, and you're having drought and water scarcity at other times of the year, surely we can put that together. Surely we can, as this thing says, catch the rain, try and find ways of harvesting the water, put it together, and try and make what is adversity into an opportunity. And we're going to be discussing that with two of the people who've been driving this entire initiative for the last few years. Uh, we're going to be joined on the program by Archana Varma, the mission director National Water Mission in the Ministry of Jal Shakti, the person who's actually driving a lot of this right now, and the person who was driving it till a little while back, who's now the Secretary General of the NHRC, somebody who also believes that water and clean water and sanitation and clean air is a human rights. Uh, Bharat Lal is going to be joining us. He's the Secretary General of the NHRC, also was at the Ministry of Jal Shakti till not that long ago. So we're going to try and find some solutions to all of this on the program. Also on the show, we're going to be discussing some of what's been happening with currency. India has just signed a bilateral currency agreement with the UAE. What is this deal all about? But more importantly, is India starting to take steps towards making the rupee a currency that trade can actually happen in? Is that a signal for the future, what the future of the rupee could actually be? And then, after all that serious stuff, we are going to be turning our attention to, yes, what you have been focusing on. Barbie and Oppenheimer and those two movies and what they mean, of course, for the cinema industry. We have a special interview lined up uh, for you. Ajay Bijli, the MD of PBR Cinemas in India, is going to be joining us to talk about how Barbenheimer mania may actually have been a real, real blessing and a possible turning point for the cinema industry in India. But before we go into that any further, let me just quickly take you through some of the big top stories that we've actually been tracking during this week. And since, since the beginning of the monsoon session, so let's turn to Parliament and some politics to start off. Indian Parliament's obviously been seeing some stormy sessions, protests, and very little actual transactions of business. For the last seven days, opposition parties have been demanding that the Prime Minister make a statement in Parliament on the situation in Manipur. After several days of protests and washouts, Congress, supported by members of the opposition India Alliance and the BRS, have moved for a no-confidence motion. The Lok Sabha Speaker has admitted the no-confidence motion. This is going to require the Prime Minister to be speaking on that and other issues now. While the no-confidence motion is bound to, uh, to fail, I mean, the numbers are pretty clear. I don't think the, even the opposition expects that they're actually going to be winning. The, I guess the key question to be asked is who's going to be winning the battle of perceptions. The opposition is hoping it's going to be cornering the government on the Manipur issue. The Prime Minister and the BJP and the other believe that by getting a chance to speak, 
the, the Prime Minister will repeat what happened in a sense in 2018, where he made it an occasion to really uh, go after the opposition and get a chance to speak at great length about some of the issues. So what's going to actually happen? Well, we'll be taking a close look at it and we will keep on reporting on that. Moving on, the Manipur issue, which of course lies at the heart of some of what's been happening in Parliament, it continues to simmer. It's been simmering since May 3rd, frankly, but of course it came into focus just before the Parliament session began with those videos of women being paraded by a mob uh, allegedly in May this year. Now, given that political debates are heating up with impending state elections also coming up in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Mizoram and Telangana, the big question that many people are asking is that the question of women's security must take center stage. Yes, the NDA and the opposition are trading barbs on this issue at every opportunity presented, but at the same time, we've got to make sure that it doesn't just become something to talk about at a political level. This is something that is important for India, for the women of the country, for the people of the country, and therefore, that is something that is going to continue to be tracked. Yes, it's going to be talked about in Parliament, but what's going to happen on the ground? They're also going to keep on tracking the cases and the record of protecting women all across the country. And before we move into our top focus, uh, the Prime Minister uh, inaugurated the Rivian Pragati Maidan complex in Delhi this week. And one of the things that he said did get a lot of people thinking. He assured the audience that India will be the third largest economy in the world. And he said it's going to happen in his third term. Now, uh, a lot of analysts then sat down and looked at that. And actually, the numbers do seem to stack up. Now, of course, it's not yet certain that it is going to be Prime Minister Modi with a, with a, with a third term uh, after 2024. But if you look at the numbers, it seems fairly likely, as per the International Monetary Fund, that whoever's in government, India is going to overtake Japan and Germany by 2027 or 2028 to become the third largest economy in the world. And that is something for everyone to take some pride in. The uh, Indian Express, for example, had some of this, this data. It said the Indian economy has grown 83 percent between 2014 to 2023. And that led to a jump from the 10th to the 5th rank recently. Now, looking forward, as long as India is growing much better than Japan and Germany, which are the countries at numbers uh, 4 and 5, it means that as long as India is relatively doing better than them, it means it will catch up with them. The gap is not that much. It's not like the gap between uh, the USA, China and the rest of the pack. The gap between India and Germany and Japan is not that much. So as long as India continues to grow at 6% or thereabouts and they keep their present growth run, uh, trends running, India should overtake both Japan and Germany by 2027 or 2028. Advance heads up notice. We will, of course, do lots of stories and special programs on the India story when that particular landmark in the India story is actually crossed. And now let's talk about climate change. And yes, I am going to be talking at some length about death and devastation and havoc and crisis. But do bear with me and do keep listening to us because I'm also going to be talking to you about opportunity. We're going to have two of the top experts in the field joining us in just a couple of minutes to tell us how adversity can be also transformed into a massive, massive opportunity. But now let's just take a look at how the weather has been for the past few weeks and the past few months. Yes, I know we've been talking about climate change, but look what's happening right now. First, there is an extreme heat wave in an area, even causing deaths. A few days later, that same area gets very heavy rainfall, so much so that there are often floods. If you think I'm talking about India, you're right, it's happening here. If you assumed I'm talking about Europe, you would still be right. America, spot on. Maybe China or Japan or Korea, absolutely. Look, for many, many years now, we have been talking and talking and talking and at the same time, ignoring climate change. Yes, it's one of those things out there. It's going to happen, but I'm not going to worry about it right now because who cares? Yeah, it's going to happen at some point, but who cares? Let's carry on with our lives. So it's, a, it's an academic area. It's some event in the future which isn't really going to affect us. But look at 2023. The threat exists and the threat exists here 
and now. And it is affecting your life. It's affecting your life right now. Let's just take a look what's been happening around the world. Before we then turn to the situation in India and to the specific opportunity that I began by talking about. But let's just take a look at the world. Let's start off by talking about the heat wave in Europe. More than 40 people have died so far in wildfires in Mediterranean nations. In Greece, thousands of people, including tourists, were recently evacuated from Rhodes and Corfu amid raging wildfires. In Italy, the summer's been so extreme that people have died inside their cars in Sardinia, while Rome and other cities have seen record-breaking temperatures. In Spain, the heat wave is exacerbating a severe drought. This is the driest period in 500 years. Meanwhile, other parts of the region have completely the opposite type of weather. Take a look at Italy. In Italy's Veneto, over 100 people were injured in unusually severe hailstorms. Serbia, Slovenia and Bosnia-Herzegovina have seen deaths among heavy rain. Croatia witnessed its most intense storm since records began in the mid-1800s. The situation is similar, by the way, in the United States of America. The heat wave has led to Phoenix, Arizona, breaking its 1974 record of consecutive days with temperatures over 43 degrees centigrade. More than 15 people are believed to have died due to the heat. The party capital, Las Vegas, has seen record-breaking temperatures, while hikers have been found dead in national parks in Nevada and in California. In Florida, new temperature records have been set in the Keys, in Miami, in Fort Lauderdale. There's a, there's a patch just off the coast of Florida which is seeing temperatures of something like 38 degrees Celsius. People don't know. Is it a mistake? Is it really possible that ocean water can be at 38 degrees Celsius? Can you believe it? Pennsylvania was struck by a severe flash flood, which killed at least five people. Floods in New York and Vermont have led to large-scale rescue operations, delayed flights, train services have been affected. Mississippi was hit by a thousand-year flood. Tornado and thumbs and strong warnings were issued for... Look, I could carry on and on and on. I'm going to keep on flashing this for you. How much do you want me to tell you? It is clear that this is happening everywhere. It's happening close to home as well. Look at China. A new highest temperature record at 52.2 degrees in West Xinjiang. Heat in Japan's Tokyo broke a 150-year trend with temperatures 9 degrees Celsius above the season average. On the other end of the spectrum, the Chinese provinces of Shizhuan, Henan and Jiangzhou were hit by heavy rain and flash floods. Does that sound familiar? South Korea saw massive death and destruction with around 40 people killed in the recent floods. Does that sound familiar? Because let's now turn our attention to India. 2023 has once again been a very weird year for India when it comes to the weather. This February, we saw the mercury rising to its highest point since 1901. Since 1901. In March, there was more rainfall than usual. Then April and May were unusually cool. They were actually cool months. But there was some sporadic rainfall. And then, June, we suddenly had a severe heat wave. Between March and June, India saw 218 heat wave deaths, the highest in 23 years. Kerala recorded 120 heat-related deaths till June, the highest in the country. Other states with a high death toll have been Gujarat, 35 deaths, Telangana, 20, Maharashtra, 14, Tamil Nadu and UP, 12 each. Bihar, in fact, had the longest continuous heat wave of 19 days in June and recorded eight deaths. And then, just after the heat wave, came the furious storms and floods. The same pattern that we've seen in other countries happening here. Over 100 people reportedly died in North India in two weeks till the mid middle of July. Delhi saw its worst floods on record. We all know about that. The Yamuna reached a 45-year high. Dozens died in Himachal, in Uttarakhand and Punjab. There were landslides, of course, in Maharashtra and Raigarh, which killed more than 20 people. 70 remain missing. Gujarat's Junagar then saw its worst flood in decades, while Ahmedabad airport was inundated. More than 35 people have died in Karnataka, which still has flood alerts in many places. Telangana also saw unprecedented rain leading to damage in homes and crops. And even in places like Rajasthan, flooding was reported from places like Jaipur, Jodhpur and Udhapur. Now, this is Rajasthan, a desert state, but there's flooding happening out there. So put the pieces together. There are 
clearly extreme weather events taking place. They are taking place in India and they are taking place in other parts of the world. So let's not bury our heads in the sand anymore. Something is happening and we need to pay attention to it. We've heard this warning coming from the United Nations just yesterday. Everyone's talking about it. There is a tipping point that apparently is being approached. We're talking about the, North, the, the Gulf Stream being switched off. All sorts of things are possible. And if that happens, the extreme weather events that we are seeing will not only continue, they could get much, much worse. All right, you've heard me. You've heard me, as you've heard me, no doubt, talking about similar things for, what, 10 years and 15 years. And yes, you're going to answer me by saying, yeah, yeah, we know about it, climate change, something has to be done. But what can we do about it? So, okay, let's start now looking for some possible solutions. Let's start looking for things that can actually be done on a day-by-day -day basis, not just at a global level, but things that countries, for example, can do. And today I'm going to come up with one very simple idea, and it says it here, catch the rain. Now, this is something that the government of India has been talking about. Campaigns have been run. But it's time for us to start questioning why solutions like this can't be found that somewhere in the adversity that we are seeing, can there still be a positive? Because let's face it, when you're dealing with death and destruction and havoc, it's good to try and find some positives because at least it gives us something practical to do and practical to think about. So, why is this important? In the middle of all of this flooding, in the middle of all of this destruction, it may be difficult to believe that there are still areas in India which have had deficient rainfall. Let's remember between June 1 and June 2023, Northwest India saw 40% more rainfall. Between July 1 and July 10, some parts of all Indian states had excess rain. But by the end of this period, there were still a large parts of the country, 20 states were still below normal. Till July the 23rd, East UP, for example, had a deficit with 29% below normal rainfall. East and Northeast India recorded a 23% rain deficit since July the 23rd. So, the point I'm coming to is, and this happens year after year after year, there's flooding in one part of the country, but other parts of the country are desperate for water. And the irony is that this repeats itself year after year because the flooding and the excess rainfall only happens during monsoon months, June, July and August. And at the rest of the time, India faces water scarcity. It's not surprising. India is 18% of the world's population, but only 4% of its water resources. Between 1947 and 2021, there's been a 75% fall in per person water availability. 75% fall. There's been encroachment on 19,000 of the 9.45 lakh water bodies that we have. Meanwhile, 14% of the country's groundwater assessment units are overexploited. 4% of them are in a critical situation. So what's the point that I'm trying to make? And I hope by the end of all of this, I've given you enough data to substantiate this. There is a water crisis on one hand with too much water, with flooding, with excess rainfalls in some places and at some times of the year. But at other times of the year and other places, there is a gaping, grave, grave shortfall. The solution is obvious. Start catching the rain. Start rainwater harvesting. Start figuring out ways that you can actually divert water from the excess to areas which have scarcity. Start finding ways that you can store water in times of excess and use it in times of scarcity. Now, how can it be done? And I'm going to come to the experts who are going to tell us in more detail as to what's actually being done already. But how can it be done? Common sense says, first way it can be done, canals and drains to divert excess water from rivers in spate. This will, number one, reduce the threat and the severity of floods and will also then make sure that that water is being diverted to places that need it. Number two, have a widespread installation of rainwater harvesting systems, especially in urban areas. This can recharge the groundwater for times of need while also preventing land subsidence and flooding. The third, the revival and the expansion of traditional storage spaces like temple tanks and step wells or baulis. 
This infrastructure already exists in many states, from Delhi to Maharashtra to all parts of the country. We must do it. We must also clear urban lakes and ponds and stormwater drains of encroachments. We must desilt them so that the water which can't be caught has space to flow, reducing the flood risk. And finally, we must take new reservoirs in places which get excess rainfall and connect them with areas with less rainfall. This can help in reducing water disputes, especially between states, in dire times. Look, with climate change worsening, extreme rainfall events are likely to get more frequent. There's a scientific reason for this. Heavier rainfall is likely in a warming atmosphere. A warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. And this leads to the formation of more droplets. So there is intense rain in a shorter space of time over a smaller area. So this will continue. Let's now figure out how to utilize it much better. Hey, India receives 3,800 billion cubic meters of water as rain and snow every single year. After evaporation, we're still left with what, 2,000 billion cubic meters as natural runoff. Let's try and find a way of just using it. Don't let that water just go down the drain, literally. And to tell us how we can actually utilize all of this water better, we're being joined by the mission director of the National Water Mission, Archana Varma. Thank you so much uh, for being with us, ma'am, and thank you so much for talking to us. You know, this entire dichotomy that we see, floods in one part, drought and scarcity in the other part, if only we could utilize that water better, wouldn't it be wonderful? And I know you're working on it, so how do you think we can do it better? So thank, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And yes, the Delhi rains this time okay. and the urban flooding and the havoc that it has created has again uh, brought forth the importance of catching the rain. So the idea is very simple. It is to nudge the states and through community-led participation to go in for water harvesting uh, measures. And as you said that, you know, uh, urban floods, even rural floods are a problem. And it is uh, only the harvesting of the rainfall which can help India achieve water security by 2050. So before I uh, get into what all can be done, I will give a little statistics to alarm you that though we have around 4,000 billion cubic uh, meter of uh, uh, precipitation, the only utilizable source of water from wherever source, whether it's surface or ground, is only 1126 billion cubic meter. So you see that India has 1126 billion cubic meter and it is said that if we don't, you know, address both the supply and the demand side, we will be falling short because our demand by 2050 will be 1180 billion uh, cubic meter. Ma'am, you know, we've done so many programs that we are talking about what to do with water. It's always been about conserve water, switch off your traps, don't waste water, don't bathe for a few months if you can possibly avoid, you know, that sort of a thing. But conservation is fine up to a point. But when you're seeing flood water everywhere, when you're seeing Mumbai underwater, you're seeing... Telangana underwater, Delhi flood pains being underwater. When you're seeing water gathered everywhere and that water literally flowing down the drain and getting wasted, you've got to ask yourself the question, surely there has to be a better way in which you can actually utilize the flood water, utilize the excess water, so you don't have to tell people don't drink, don't consume, conserve, just harvest the water more effectively. Yes, uh, very true. Uh, while the steps that you suggested, they are also very important. But in terms of volume, harvesting on rainwater, uh, you know, is very, very uh, uh, crucial that we harvest. We can only harvest the monsoon if our planning is proper. Yeah. So it all depends on proper pre-planning of the states or the municipalities or the local bodies, panchayats, the district administration. Just interrupt you for a minute. When you're talking about storage facility, has there been a change of thinking on that also? Because once upon a time, it was often said that the only correct way to store water, you must have these big Bhakra Nangal type mega projects. Now, 
uh, increasingly a lot of the view seems to be that the traditional way is still good. The bowlies, the check dams, things that perhaps we've had for centuries. And it may be more effective to do this at the micro level, at the village or the panchayat level, rather than large scale mass schemes. Would you agree with that? See, I would not say that the dams uh, don't, have not served any purpose. In fact, a lot of uh, progress of India is attributed to the dams. But yes, of late, you know, we are slowly moving away from mega dams to these uh, water harvesting structures, which is the focus of Catch the Rain. Like there are two things which can be done in urban areas, which is being done in India to prevent urban flooding. As I said, first is you plan. And second, for urban areas, it has to be rooftop rainwater harvesting. And, and second is artificial recharge of our uh, dug wells and bore wells. That is the only solution for urban flooding. I mean, apart from the new technologies, like you have spawn cities and you have storm water drainage systems, you have green spaces and no encroachment, no pollution. Those are the measures which can be there, but the biggest uh, technology which will work to prevent urban flooding is we have pre-planned our storage capacities through reach, uh, through you know rejuvenating our dug dug wells and bore wells uh, and rain uh, water rooftop harvesting for which the citizens also need to contribute. So these are the ways in which urban flooding can be managed. Thank you, Archana Ji. And from our side, we'll try and do whatever we can to also change mindsets, which at the end of the day is what this program is all about. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure talking to you. Such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Well, let's now get another top expert to talk about this. Somebody who has really was one of the first people to start pushing very aggressively on how you can actually do catching the rain and water harvesting. Uh, somebody who also has been doing a lot of work on how sanitation is particularly important on this, because you can't just catch the rain or capture water if that water is not clean. Sanitation becomes a very important uh, part of this. Uh, it's a great pleasure now to be joined by Mr. Bharat Lal, who was former additional secretary, drinking water and sanitation in the Ministry of Jal Shakti. is right now the secretary general of the NHRC and also one of the people who believes that at the NHRC that, look, clean water, clean air, these are very much human rights, and therefore it is, it is particularly important. Bharatlaji, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. Now, we've been discussing water and catch the rain and rainwater harvesting for many, many years. I've done so many programs with you, so I felt that we must, of course, get your expertise on this. But even from the point of view of the NHRC and, the, you know, as human rights, do you believe that something like water is at the end of the day a human right and it is something which we should prioritize. You should have clean water, you should have clean air for, mat for that matter, and that should be a human right for everyone. Well, as we all know that uh, a country like ours, where out of 365 days, we have roughly 20 plus minus 5, 6 days as rainy days. And whatever rainfall we get, the idea is that you collect it, store it, and use it wisely. That is more important. So conservation means not only protection of water sources or basically using water efficiently. It means, it means proper utilization, efficient utilization, as well as storage. Now, in Indian context, when we are having, you know, hardly 25, 30 days as rainy days, whatever water we get, we have to collect it, store it safely and use it for whole one year, maybe, maybe next year. Because of climate change, I think we all are seeing that uh, we are have high intensity rainfall and basically which leads to flood. In fact, we also are having rainfall in unexpected drought prone, semi-arid and arid region. Take Western India, Gujarat and Maharashtra. There are many places basically which were traditionally known as drought prone. We are having heavy rain. It means we have to prepare ourselves to store, to catch that water, to catch that rainfall, store it and then use it. The good part is that like I have seen in Gujarat in the last 20 years, a number of steps have been taken where basically all these water bodies have been rejuvenated. All these reservoirs and dams have been desilted and re rejuvenated. So their storage capacity has increased. Now your second part is that water conservation 
our 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 uh, water security does not mean just simply reduce the consumption the real issue is that how to use the water efficiently it means we have to learn about that part also all right bharat laji let me now turn to the question on which we, i have done a campaign with you just a, a couple of years ago water water being treated not just as something which you have to try and conserve and worry about the consumption but also how you utilize it better now take a look at what we are seeing all around us on tv screens in the newspapers so much flooding so much water being wasted and this is fresh water there's an emphasis on fresh water this is a fresh water being wasted causing damage and destruction along with that how do we utilize this better uh, just want to get your thoughts on that see one thing so when it comes to storing water over ground it has certain limitations and especially if you went in drought prone and desert region if you see that are there are very few water bodies or few reservoirs but second important part, part is that if we basically rejuvenate them we we desilt them we strengthen them i think you can more, store more water that is one part but second untapped territory is basically recharging of aquifers so if you have excess water and you have recharge structure it means you can store this water underground in aquifer the only precondition is that that we have to keep our surface clean means it should be open defecation free so that human fecal matter or contamination doesn't go basically in underground uh, aquifers so whole country has to work about basically on storing water underground and when i talk about underground is not only in basically underground tanks and you know you know rain water harvesting structure alone it is more important to store this water in unlimited aquifers and lastly i think we have to start respecting water we have to construct when we are taking real estate development or, or, or any 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 kind of infrastructure development we must see where is the drainage line where water in what direction it is going and this this way forward is that a store over the ground and recharge aquifer look let let's face it uh, barlaji climate change is here to stay it seems rain bombs that we've seen in gujarat flash floods flooding events these are likely to continue so we got to find a way of mitigating it we must find mechanisms that we can use when it is raining so uh, raining so heavily during the monsoon that we mitigate the bad impact of that and yet utilize the water for times of scarcity absolutely the only precondition is that we have to i repeat again and again that we have to improve our sanitation the swachh bharat mission which has been launched basically whether urban or rural area it has to be continuously and basically it is in the hands of people you know, you know. so we have to have clean water basically to take it to our aquifers so precondition is that that our water should not be dirty So Bharat Lal the secretary general of the National Human Rights Commission and the person who was a, a additional secretary looking at drinking water and sanitation till not that long back thank you so much sir for joining us uh, with that very very valuable perspective All right let's turn to our regular segment where we are track what all the global uh, press is, is is actually saying about India so to start off um, there's there's this article in Nikkei Asia talking about how the IMF has upgraded India's economic growth to 6.1% making it the fastest growing major economy uh, while also pointing out that China's recovery has slowed down to 5.2% that coming out in Japan's Nikkei Asia it's also saying that emerging asian economies including ASEAN 5 are expected to drive global growth and the global growth forecast has also been raised to 3% largely due to india's strong domestic investment but it says that inflation and geopolitical tensions remain major concerns Moving on uh, the Guardian has an article on India's ban on rice exports it says it raises fears of global food price rises remember there's already a pressure on food prices because of what's happening in Ukraine and Russia and the Guardian saying that India banning the exports of non basmati white rice to combat local inflation and domestic inflation uh, is something which could have an impact on prices across the world and moving on Al Jazeera had an article about Christopher Nolan's movie Oppenheimer and the Al Jazeera noted how it has sparked online outrage in India for featuring a sex scene involving the Hindu holy scripture the Bhagavad Gita the biographical drama of course has done really well in the Indian box office and we're going to be talking about that a little later in the program but that controversial scene has led to 
calls for a boycott and angry remarks from the government as well. Let's turn our attention now to some steps that are increasingly being taken to internationalize the rupee. For example, India and the UAE have signed a pact where the rupee can be used for the settlement of bilateral trade and other such agreements are being signed elsewhere. Now, it's early days yet to actually assess the full impact of these moves, but what is clear is India's intention, whether it is the currency agreement with the UAE or partnering with a slew of countries, the latest being France to extend the linkage with our digital platform, uh, payments platform UPI. The aim is clear, to try and find ways to internationalize the Indian rupee. In fact, the Reserve Bank of India has released a report outlining the path for this. However, there are questions like what happens to the volatility of the rupee with potentially multiple such bilateral arrangements actually being put into place. Also, some would say that if India's eventual aim should be capital account convertibility, are such agreements the right way forward? But the other big angle here that we must keep in mind is that the supremacy of the US dollar is being questioned more and more. There have been multiple attempts to try and challenge the supremacy of the dollar, particularly by China, of course, which has long been trying to position the yuan or the renminbi as an international currency. Many European countries have also given up their own currencies to adopt the euro and try and make that into some sort of a global currency. But that was promising as an initiative initially, but things did change after the European crisis. Now we are seeing what seems to be a growing trend of emerging economies trying to reduce the, their reliance on the US dollar. But the larger question is, how plausible is a scenario where the US dollar is not the world's default currency? And for India, the question is, can the rupee ever actually become something that will become a major currency being used and traded around the world? And for more on that, it's great now to be joined by Dr. Ajay Sahai, DG and CEO of the Federation of Indian Export Organization, and also Dr. Subhada Rao, who's the founder of Contico Research. Uh, thank you both so much uh, for joining us. Now, interesting arrangements, uh, Dr. Sahai, that have been put into place between India and the UAE, for example. How do you see this panning out? Yeah, absolutely. India is more integrating into the global trade and they are also looking into joining the global value chain. From that perspective, we are looking into the free trade agreement, both with a view to give out push to the trade and also whatever little investment we are getting it. We want that we should propel those investment, giving them the better market access to the free trade agreement. At the same time, we are also looking into that lot of countries in the world. They are moving away from dollar and any other foreign currencies. They are short of foreign exchange also. That provides us an opportunity to look into trading with them in the local currency and also trading in the Indian rupees. So with these objectives in view, the Reserve Bank of India has provided the facility of trading in Indian rupees and of late we have seen with Singapore and with now UAE, we are looking into a swap kind of local trading arrangement as well. Uh, Dr. Rao, this entire question of being able to trade in Indian rupees, that's not that we haven't done this in the past, but is it something that can become a mainstay for Indian trade going forward? Because I guess there's also that question of how much requirement that country has for Indian rupees. What is the actual balance of trade and how much requirement they have for Indian rupees before they're willing to shift everything to, to trading in the rupee? No, I think very well uh, put, Vikram, because uh, this is a time where uh, globally India is being perceived as the most attractive destination, be it for portfolio investment and more importantly for the for foreign direct investment. And at a time when the world is looking at diversifying its sources of uh, uh, goods and services, I think India is perhaps in the sweetest spot ever. And this is the time where uh, policymakers, both at the government, and the central bank will have to think through a long-term game plan uh, where we can aspire to uh, increase our uh, share in total trade and exports. Currently, we are at a minuscule of 2% or 2.2%. But for Indian rupee to become uh, a huge uh, reserve currency or the biggest trading currency, we obviously need to expand our footprint across the global trade map. Having said, I think this uh, initial, these initial steps uh, 
are absolutely well timed, uh, uh, well opportunistic, if I may say so, in a nice way, in a positive way, because as Dr. Sahai put it, we are already underway of foreign trade agreements whereby we can, uh, uh, you know, look country specific uh, in terms of settlement of our uh, trade in local currencies as we have initiated with right. uh, UAE. Dr. Sai, do you think these things should continue to be done on a one-by-one -one bilateral basis? Or from a trading point of view, is it better to simply join one of the larger trading organizations? So you can do, I mean, you can do a lot of individual FTA, so you can just come up and join the last trans-Pacific trading blocks, for example, or other things that, uh, that do exist. No, in fact, I think um, it's, uh, of course, very... Uh, well said that we should look for a kind of a regional agreement rather than a country specific agreement but then the negotiation becomes quite difficult we know that we are struggling to form up one with the eu for last many years because when you are dealing with 28 economies the political setup keeps on changing a lot so dealing with one country becomes little easier so my personal take is that we should pick up one or two important country into a regional block form up with the trade agreement with them and then try to replicate on the group. So far as the currencies are concerned, I think we, when we are looking into the countries who have already expressed their desire and where the banks have tied up, these are across the geographies. We have already tied up with around 19 countries, 64 banks are in the pipeline. But I think to start with the process, we have to look into what are the challenges, why system is not working in a big way. Please bear in mind that this is an additional window which has been provided to the trade. The existing mechanisms are in place. It's much more better to start with a kind of swap arrangement because then both sides are insulated against the foreign currency risk. When we are talking about the rupee, on the Indian side, they are insulated because they are paying for imports and getting paid for exports in rupee. But the other side, they have to get the payment in their currency. And since in with most of these countries, we are not having a direct exchange rate, the cross currency comes into the play, which eats around three to 4% of the entire transaction value. And the other side is therefore little reluctant to that. So it's a very good move because we will be able to deal with those countries who are short of the foreign exchange. All right, Dr. Rao, last word from you. Now, we've been talking, hearing about de-dollarization for a while right now. Do you think uh, it's, it's in, the, in the near future? Do you think, I mean, for example, are we going to continue to have country-specific swap arrangements? Or do you think it's possible that another currency could come, the BRICS currency comes? I'm not sure India and countries like India would accept the yuan as a currency. So what, if anything, could replace the dollar? Uh, you really have to extend the time horizon pretty longish. Uh, it's not going to be an event. It's going to be a process that to a slow moving process, because uh, as as Dr. Sahai also put it uh, rightly, I mean, uh, you at uh, multilateral agencies, perhaps the trade negotiations are very cumbersome and many a times counterproductive. Regional trades would be the way forward, but there would be be some counter interests in the play, how to utilize those uh, surpluses, that also needs to be thought through. Yes, uh, prima facie on paper, it's extremely efficient mode of uh, taking your currency uh, offshore and uh, uh, you know bring rupee as a more acceptable medium of exchange but there's a whole lot of groundwork that needs to get done to start with we should also consider now looking at capital account fully capital account convertibility uh, as we move ahead with an aspiration of india growing at about two trillion dollar of exports by 2030. dr Rao, dr sai thank you so much for joining us let's see what happens with the currencies and before we go, a special segment for you and a very special interview, keeping aside the Bhagwat Gita controversy, which of course has been uh, really dominating a lot of the headlines. It's been a rare clash of Hollywood films in India. Two interesting and very diverse films, Barbie and Oppenheimer, released on the same day on June the 21st. And they both seem to have brought cinema lovers back to the theatres, which frankly have not exactly seen a very successful run this year so far over the last couple of years. But a simultaneous release of Barbie and Oppenheimer has generated excitement among cinema enthusiasts, drawing them back to the big screens. And a lot of people are saying that this might perhaps lead to a revival 
of the entire cinema industry. And I'm not going to tell you about the films. You know about them. Barbie, Oppenheimer, enough has been written. So let's just get a very special guest onto the program. Ajay Bijli, the managing director of PVR Inox, uh, is now with us. Um, Ajay, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, if you were talking about the revival of the cinema business and what's going to happen to cinema halls and cinema theatres like yours, would you have believed that it would have been two Hollywood films that would have actually done this, got so many people excited? Nobody was expecting that uh, a movie which is three hours, uh, 18 minutes long, a movie which uh, is not a franchise movie. Like typically you have Fast and the Furious, 9, 10, you have Mission Impossible 7, you have Marvel, DC, all these franchise movies have brought people back into the cinemas in India and abroad post-COVID and even pre-COVID. But suddenly two brand new movies, Oppenheimer is a brand new story, old story, but a, a very different genre altogether. And Barbie is the first uh, of its kind. They brought people back, so it's very heartening uh, uh, to see people coming back and talking about films on the big screen rather than OTT TV shows. <laughs> and you know, it's not necessarily, these are necessarily movies like, you know, Avatar or something, but you have to go and get the cinema experience. I could have understand to the hype around, you know, one of those films, which are movies that you have to go to the cinema hall for. These are technically movies that you can say, but I can watch it later whenever they release on OTT. So to that extent, the hype is even more interesting. I think the always, uh, you know, over a period of time, uh, Vikram, this has happened, a fatigue factor comes in, in, in whatever you're doing uh, too much of. Uh, so last two, three months, we've been sensing it a little bit. Uh, the data points are all showing that uh, movies are doing well, people are coming back. So if I go back to last quarter, even movies of Vicky Kaushal, which is a small movie, not advertised at all. In fact, three weeks prior to the uh, release of the movie, uh, they decided what the movie should be, Zara Hatke, Zara Bachke. Uh, three weeks prior to the release, they decided what the name of the movie should be. That ended up doing about 80, 90 crores. Another movie came of uh, Karthik Aran, not very heavily promoted. That ended up doing well. Uh, some Hollywood films came in the middle. They started doing well. So we could sense it that there was some sort of a fatigue factor coming of people just sitting at home, have, putting their feet up and watching these TV shows. So TV shows are brilliant, but I think the pendulum had shifted too much uh, towards just staying at home and watching content. And now it's sort of balanced itself out a little bit and which I'm very happy about, which is what I was hoping for anyway. So let's look at the future of the industry. Look, obviously in the pandemic era, the concern about, oh, let's not go to the movie because people could fall sick. Now that's in the past and that's a good news. What would be the friction points right now? I guess first of all would be the question of cost. Now we have heard people cribbing about that on social media. They want to pay for the ticket, which is fine, but then you're buying popcorn and other stuff and that is adding to this massive, massive price tag. Imagine you could get a whole year's entertainment for that. So would cost become one of the major factors? I know you've been trying to make some efforts to address that after the criticism that has come in. Yeah. Well, uh, to be honest with you, the good news is the appetite to go out and watch movies is back, which is something that I was uh, concerned about due to various factors. Uh, what, what, uh, more, before I come to the cost, the biggest issue is most of the people that we listen to, I'm not saying cost is not important, it's extremely important, it's a relative thing. The price of a ticket for some people is expensive, some people is not. Uh, but at the same time, uh, people are saying we are more time poor than cash poor. So I think the consistency of content which connects with the consumer is the most vital thing today because that is where uh, I think the South Indian industry has done a brilliant job. They're going back to the uh, uh, drawing board. They're looking at the scripts. They're looking at what is connecting. And out of the 512 screens that we've got in the South and about 1300, uh, 1200 in the rest of the country, those are back to pre pandemic levels. So I think content for me is the number one thing, that flow of content, quantity and quality. Okay, so let me come back to the friction points, right? So the other friction point, I guess, would be the price of food and drink. Because even if someone says, all right, fine, we're spending 300 or 400 or 700 and going and seeing a, a movie, that's, that's fine, maybe I can do it. But 200 rupees or 300 rupees for a popcorn or for a drink, 200 rupees for a Pepsi, what on earth are you talking about? That's the, the, the feedback that I think you also started, started to get. Absolutely, Vikram, you're, not, you're absolutely spot on and we need to be very uh, sensitive to that. So we had a very 
telling a tweet, uh, uh, somebody went to Mall of India, one of our cinemas in Noida, and he put that, you know, 800 rupees bill and on our face on Twitter and, you know, all, all hell broke loose. And uh, that was an eye opener for us. We were very fortunate that at the same time, uh, the GST, uh, you know, a debate got over that, that the uh, GST is only 5% now on FNB. It was, there was a huge ambiguity, whether it's 5% or 18% for the last two, three years, that uh, debate got settled. And we immediately came out with that bottomless uh, popcorn and Pepsi offer on the weekends. And we came out with a 99 rupees combo. And uh, honestly, it has been incredible. And uh, so it's been a blessing in disguise that that tweet came. And of obviously this, uh, uh, you know, this uh, GST also got rationalized. Right. So that's uh, given a big uh, uh, sort of uh, relief but, to us. But, but you know, maybe that maybe that's a secret. Maybe it's not actually Oppenheimer or Barbie. It's it's a fact that popcorn and Pepsi are cheaper. Maybe that's a more important factor than Oppenheimer. No, no, no. Oppenheimer has played a big role because it, our, our business is binary. Only when movies are good, people come in. Uh, but but having said that, uh, I've always been saying one more thing from the other side of my mouth is that uh, basically somewhere I find okay agreed some you know prices had to be rationalized at the same time comparing a popcorn or a pepsi on the roadside to comparing a popcorn pepsi price in a infrastructure that we built for a multiplex i thought was also a bit unfair it was an apple to apple comparison All right ajay bijay thank you so much for joining us and let's see let's see what happens in the next few months in the cinema industry thanks a lot for joining us and that's all we have time for on this episode of the India Story. But do join us again next week as we continue to look at all the big issues that are coming out of India and we talk to the biggest newsmakers in this country. Thanks a lot for watching. Bye for now. Resort is unique, the only one of its kind. Experience the four paths of natural wellness yoga, Ayurveda, acupuncture, and naturopathy. Each uniquely customized program improves the whole person to make every person whole. Come to Yo One Health Resort. Make your reservation at yoone.com. It's easy to tell you a flat story. It's easy to show you what's happening around the world. We do the difficult part. This weapon has been banned, but the US, Ukraine and Russia do not find the bombs problematic. We also tell you why what's happening. A new drug is making a difference in the fight against Alzheimer's. This medicine helps slow down a patient's cognitive decline. We look beyond the text. We give you context. Is China preparing for a war in the Himalayas? And tonight, we come to you with some proof. The hypocrisy is stunning. Do leaders mean what they say? Do they ever say what they mean? To find out how real news affects you, your decisions. Just when Iran took one step in the right direction, its moral police is planning to drag it further back. And once again, the victim will be women. Watch Gravitas. We don't impose our views. Did India threaten to ban Twitter? Either that or Jack Dorsey is lying to you. That is Gravitas. We let life breathe through our show. Gravitas, the informed show for an intelligent audience.